Welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today, we're joined by Andrew Grant. Andrew is uh, author of Who Killed Creativity, uh, also CEO of Tyrion. Um, he's been on TEDx Talks out of Hong Kong and um, talking about Who Killed Creativity. There's a really good story around that. And I love the way he's framed that uh, in the book and the characters all within it. So, Andrew, thanks for joining us and um, love to dig in on uh, ideation, creativity, and what it might mean for a business, a startup, or someone that's looking to um, build out ideas in any context, really. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great to be here. So, Andrew, tell us a little about yourself, um, your business, and what you've been doing for the past 20, 30 years, I'd say. Well, we've uh, been in business with my partner and I for over 20 years. Um, we started in Asia and just pretty much working in the conference industry, working with uh, teams that were obviously cross-cultural teams, the old expat local situation coming up. And we found ourselves going to conferences and being asked to give input from an educational background on conferences and soon discovered that the typical conference was very boring in the morning with lots of keynote talks and childish in the afternoon with silly team building games and then everyone got drunk at night. And we thought that's probably not, you know, the best use of people's money if they really, <clears throat> they really want to learn something and, and try and understand something. So we would come to the conferences with lots of creative ideas of how to make that morning session more interactive, how to make the afternoon session more intelligent and how to be more celebratory at night. Um, so we were never shy of creative ideas and we've been doing that for many years. And then some of our clients actually identified uh, that they liked our creativity. And they, they, we're talking about banking clients, you know, that are typically not, um, not, not the type of clients that say we like creativity. But they came and said, look, boy, you know, you've really, you know, if we've been working with you for years now, we love your creativity. Could you teach us about creativity? Um, and that, that sort of got us started on the whole importance of how creativity can solve problems and deal with problems and uh, help people. And we're talking about the average person, not, not the design thinking team that's shoved in a corner and given all the models of agile and sprint and lean and all that. But we're talking about the average person and how valuable creative thinking can be for them. So that grew into a book and then workshops and then a gamified game around who killed creativity. Of course, we, um, when we're asked by Wiley US to, to publish, to write the book, we have to submit a, a long document as why do you need another book on creativity? There's plenty out there and, and we certainly discovered that. So we're asked to identify the gap in the market of where the, where, where our book might fit a need so they're not going to waste it sitting on bookshelves and not being bought. And we soon discovered there were plenty of books on how to be creative. There was an infinite number of steps on how you can be creative, design thinking, how your team can be creative. But what was really missing was the assumption that everyone already is creative, the assumption that we want to be creative, the assumption that we have a creative culture, and most of all, the assumption that as adults, we are creative. And so we would get uh, these banks now, uh, you know, five years down the road, sending their participants to our workshops, and we'd be all excited and talk all about how to be creative and why you should be creative. And before we knew it, they were sitting there going, well, that's not my job. I'm, I'm in banking. I'm in tech. I mean, you know, I wasn't paid to be a, a creative. Uh, why should I be at this workshop? And we soon realized there was no point in teaching the skills and the model of design thinking or even steps to being creative unless we address the actual issue of what's blocking people's creativity. As we said, you don't need to pay a lot of money to have a workshop leader tell you how to be creative. There's too many books and videos on that. But there was no diagnostic, there was no ability to help people explore um, their own journey from childhood to adulthood, to explore their company culture, their team culture, even perhaps their country culture or the, the group that they grew up with all or their parents all leads to the fact that, yes, I'm going to look at this from a creative perspective and solve it going outside the box or I'm just going to follow the, the, the procedural way of doing it. And so as we discovered more and as we started to write the book, we realized that was really missing. And we partnered with a neuroscientist and psychologist to try and really um, understand all the feedback we were getting from our workshops as to why people felt 
this wasn't for us. And yet we have the, we, we'll talk later on about why creativity is important and why companies say it is the number one skill you need now. Um, and that didn't obviously connect with people saying, well, that's not my job and I'm not creative anyway. So we really had to focus the first half of the book on what's blocking creativity, what, what is that journey from childhood where we were all creative to adulthood where we're not, um, and go from there. And then when people get those blocks out of the way, you'll find that the creativity naturally flows. So on that, um, is every person's experience different? So everyone's got their own blockers in the creative cycle uh, process. Is that how it sort of frames out through the book? That's right. I mean, as I said, we're all a, a, a I don't want to use the word victim, <laughs> but we are, we are using, I mean, just one thing, we, we decided to theme it because we wanted it to be memorable. I mean, heaven help if we wrote a book on creativity that was boring. That's like an, educa that's like an educational lecture giving you a, a, a talk on education and just reading off notes. I mean, but at the same time, we didn't want to make it gimmicky or childish or cheap or nasty, but we felt the theme of a crime scene was quite appropriate because... You know, we're looking at what's blocking creativity and why were we, um, as, as, as we'll talk about later on, why are most children very creative and most adults not? And so we did want to theme it up with that crime scene. So I will use the word victim, but we're all victims of our, of our culture, our upbringing, perhaps a little bit of our genetic uh, brain, you know, the way our brains have been wired, left and right brain, back and front brain. Um, it's all a mishmash, and therefore some of us are very comfortable to throw out a creative idea, even if we're not asked for it, whereas others you'd have to, you know, squeeze it out of them and they still wouldn't be able to come up with one. And that is, a, as I said, a real mix of our both nature versus nurture in terms of where we are at today. And I think if we really want to go and be, be creative, you can't just um, have a pizza Friday or announce a hackathon and ask people to work all weekend and expect them to be creative after oppressing their creativity for uh, maybe days, weeks, months, years or decades. And so therefore, it, it is important to get people to understand what's blocking that creative process, what's slowing it down. And let's use the crime scene so it's memorable who killed creativity with what weapon how do we get it back? And that became our, our theme. Yeah. Now, just in saying creativity for any of the listeners out there, is it just the ability to come up with I different ideas? Well, that's or a very good specifically? point. Well, that's right. I mean, a lot of people, um, they make the false assumption creativity is about being artistic, um, singing, dancing, music, painting, poetry. Uh, I'm none of those. I, yeah, I, neither couldn't, am I. I couldn't paint or poet to save my life. I, I did do music, but in another world. Um, so we are not looking along the artistic creative side when we're talking about creativity. So, Anthony, that's a really good point. We're actually looking at the, the, the business definition of creative thinking, which goes hand in hand with critical thinking, which we'll talk about later on. And that is the ability to come up with different, prob different solutions to existing problems, to define them differently, to look for, uh, I know it's very overused, but to look outside the box, to look at a problem from a different perspective, the uh, go outside where most people tend to be standing to solve it, and really the bringing together of novel ideas um, to come up with something new. So it is a classic case of a one plus one equals three. And look, we look at all the inventions that we've, you know, from the iPhone right through to the printing press and probably say, well, I could have done that. Well, we didn't. Um, and yet there was those creative breakthroughs where someone said, well, I can take this and I can take this and I can put it together to come up with something greater than the sum of its parts. And if there's anything needed in business at the moment, and I know that you, 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 you've got a lot of startup people listening to this, we're not asking you to start up something that's already there. Your job is to take a one plus one and equal three. Why make a one plus one equal two? It's been done before. And so it's really important that you've got to come up, you've got to get your mind in that creative space to be able to work out how do you take two existing things uh, or three and put them together and come up with something greater than the sum of its parts. And that really is what creative thinking is. Now, the critical thinking is to make sure it actually works. And maybe we can talk about that later or in another podcast. Uh, there's no point having just creative thinking if you can't actually get it across the line and make it work. So, you know, those left brain people that love to be in finance and, and might just be purely, you know, numbers orientated, their time will come because, because there's no book just come. There's lots of creative ideas out there, but we also have to make them work. And so there is a, a process and a model that we use. Um, there's, there's lots out there. They're all based around design thinking or creative problem solving. But all these models basically take you from that initial novel idea through to connecting it, 
through to making sure you're connecting it with the most number of options, then connecting the best ones, and then applying them to see if they'll actually work. Okay, so just to frame that a little bit simply, so the one plus one equals three that you're mentioning, that's more of like an evolution or an iterative approach where there's existing ideas and you build off them and improve them slightly or majorly. Catastrophically, yes. They can absolutely be incremental. Um, look, there are, there are philosophers that will tell you there's nothing new under the sun, right back from mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes. Um, so, there, you know, there are very, very few brand spanking new ideas out there. Uh, we like to think that creativity is all about taking something from nothing that didn't happen for, hasn't happened a lot. Um, yeah. Really, it is about finding... Um, solutions to what's called a wicked problem and a wicked problem is something that doesn't necessarily have a definition or doesn't necessarily or can't be defined or it's morphing or it's evolving or we don't really know enough about it as a matter of fact the problem is as undefined as the solution so it's not a linear engineering approach it is trying to take something that is that is unknown getting some legs around it, defining it, and then and then coming up, go, putting it through a creative thinking model to see if we can come up with a solution that will be different to our competitors uh, or better than our competitors. So, yeah, I, there's not a lot of new ideas out there. It is, the, it, is the, it is the connection of ideas to the point of where they make them work. And that's why when we look at some of these inventions, we go, gosh, it wasn't that hard to do that. But hindsight's a wonderful gift, isn't it? Yeah. And it's also why you see throughout time that multiple people are working on a similar idea at the same time. Yes, well then, then you can get other. into team creativity, which is even better, um, because really what we're trying to do is get all those perspectives. And so we, we do like to start with the individual, and then we would love to try and get the team to it. We're not asking everyone to have the same level or approach to creative thinking. There's so many different versions of creative thinking. Uh, but if you just took the, the exploring people that love to explore ideas and the preserving people that love to preserve things in, um, it's time for that team to work together. Let the explorers go out and do all the ideation. Let the preservers come in and make sure it happens so team creativity is really, really critical. Um, that's stage two. I think we need to, first of all, start getting comfortable up here, and then we get the team together to and, 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 and give the team some, in our workshops, we give the team some structure on how they should work together as a team, what, what should be done, when should it be done, when is it time to say that idea won't work, because you don't want to be saying that during the ideation stage, because then you'll just kill the creativity. And we've had incidences where the boss has, um, who employed us didn't come to the session, which I think is just appalling because he thinks it's just a training session and almost condescendingly pat us on the head and say, enjoy your training. And he comes back two days later and the company's got, you know, thousands of stupid ideas up around the room on flip charts. And he comes back for the presentation. Now, why I say stupid is most of the ideas that come up are stupid, but we're not looking for thousands. We're just looking for one. That's all that matters. And you're not going to get that one until you go through thousands. So he comes back at the end of the two days. He sits in the middle of the room. He, he freaks out because he looks all around. He sees all this stuff every He crosses his arms like this. Already his body language is bad because he didn't go through the whole process of ideation, failure, redo it, go back. It's a messy problem. The first group gets up and presents. They're really excited. And he just sits there and nods. Second group, by the time the fourth group had got up, they're all pushing each other, saying, no, you do it, you do it, I don't want to do it. The boss that employed us to teach creativity killed it within two days. Killed it within 15 minutes, actually, because he wasn't there and he didn't understand the whole process of what the team goes through and all the, you know, they say in video editing, everything on, that's on the cutting room floor that gets thrown out. Um, so, so this is the mistake that we're making. So, yes, teams are important. But it is also important to get to get people to feel comfortable to share their ideas. And that's, as I said, not going to happen by oppressing a group of people for many years and then thinking you can just have a creative brainstorming session on a Friday night over a few beers. Yeah, and that... Yeah, so... Sorry, I have to rephrase what I've got in my head. <laughs> um, so that yeah, ability to go through ideas and fail and evolve and try and get to the, the right idea at the end point do you see that happening with multiple people like arriving at the same idea independently? Because um, I see that's yes, been done yes. over time with like inventions. Uh, we, well, yes and no. I mean, we our, our, our design thinking workshop, so we've got one on who killed creativity, which we'll talk about, which was the first half of the book, which is the diagnostic. But when we move into that design thinking workshop, which is uh, now our, our program number, CSI number two, then what we do is we take them through a seven-step process of design thinking. 
Uh, but what's really fun is we, we get them to practice on a case study. So we will get a, a Procter & Gamble case study entering into an Asia market, which is, so how do you take a premium product and enter it into a low-cost market? And we walk, them, we walk each table through or each virtual team through the seven stages. And it's really interesting to see how many of them end up coming to the same conclusion that Procter & Gamble came to. Uh, mind you, okay. it took us three hours. It took Procter & Gamble three years. So I always tell them they can always have a job at P&G if they could do it in three hours. But yeah, if you can, if you can guide them through as a facilitator, you can guide them to conclusions. But look, we're not after the one. We're after lots of ideas. And then when you get into that critical thinking, it's about bringing them down. But it is very important that it is a facilitated process. And it really is better done by a professional facilitator that lives and breathes it rather than thinking you can just do it together. Look, I, I often have clients say to me, can we, can we have some of our team become your facilitators because we, we don't want to pay for your facilitators? And my answer is sure. Can some of my facilitators go and be some of your accountants at the same time? And the answer is no. And I said, well, you know, please don't undervaluate the importance of a professional facilitator because that's our job to not just train and teach, but to actually draw out from the audience um, what they want to, what they need to know and what they want to hear. Yep. So in terms of who killed creativity, let's dig in because I think everyone would want to know uh, some of the key suspects here. So explain this and how you got to um, the key suspects. And you mentioned that you had um, some doctors and, and a part of the process. So talk through that and let's shed some light on this. Well, as I said, we've been running these design thinking workshops for so many years. We, we basically were collecting everyone's excuses. Um, and we're thinking, well, if we don't, and, you know, so we just, the, 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 the first iteration of our workshop, CSI One workshop, was all about here are some of the reasons why people are not creative. Let's talk about them before we go any further. Um, but then we started to put it into the book and come up with um, characters and uh, mafia mobs and then, and then sub characters. So we, we had the whole theme running through it. But basically, we, we really distilled it down to seven key killers or seven key suspects. And then it was really nice to go to our neuroscientists and psychologists and say, well, what's going on up here? So, for example, one of the suspects is fear, and that could be fear of the unknown, fear of, the, fear of failure or fear of risk. And so you go to the neuroscientists and you say, what's going on in the brain when people are under fear? What, what's, what's happening in their brain? And what we know is that when you're under fear, if a bomb goes off or an earthquake or, or even a loud noise, Immediately, uh, your brain cells all, you know, you've only got a certain amount of bandwidth, but everything rushes to the, to the back of your brain, which is the, the base stem of your brain, because it, it goes into survival mode. And it's all about, you know, I've got to get away from that bomb or that loud noise. Uh, nothing in your brain has time to think creatively and say, let's sit down and have an ideation session. So under fear... Um, you are, if you're coming to the office, now fear was, was designed as a survival thing. We're not saying fear is wrong. Fear is fantastic because it, it saves our lives, um, but it, it kills creativity. So if you're in an office environment where, you're, where, where it was meant to be uh, just an instant, but you're in an environment that's fear is, is there every day you're in the office, fear of the boss, fear of failure, fear of risk, fear of unknown, um, your behaviour is constantly being driven from that fear and therefore you're really working the base part of your brain to just survive the day. That's what I'm saying. There's no way you can then sit down and do a brainstorming session when you're living in the back part of your brain. And so it was really interesting to, um, you know, it's called the dorsal dive, the fight, flight or freeze. So it was very interesting for the psychologist to say, well, people are afraid of coming up with creative ideas. What's actually happening? And then he goes on and explains what's going on. Uh, another one of the killers was control, and that's the controlling boss, the controlling environment, the, the micromanaging environment. Um, you know, we're reading regularly that there are more psychopathic behaviours in corporate CEOs than there are in, in prisons at the moment, which is kind it's of scary. Uh, and, and therefore, if you've got that micromanaging control freak boss... Um, that won't allow you to to think freely, and, and uh, then it's then it's not going to be possible to 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 be creative. And if that's the environment you're working in every day, and you go in and you might go in as a newbie and go, I got this great idea, and then the boss shuts it down and says, don't be stupid, because maybe it was stupid. But then the next day you might come back with another stupid idea and another stupid idea. And one day you might come back with a, with a new iPhone. Um, but if the boss has shut that down or the, or the environment is an environment of control, then again, it, 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 it goes to different parts of our brain network and it actually blocks the ability to be creative when you're living in that controlling 
phase. Now, the big question is, does fear create control or does control create fear? Well, you know, it's fun to play the game and we've got all these fictional cards, whether it's virtual or, or face-to-face. And really what we're doing is getting people to play and hide behind the characters because nobody's going to say, no one's going to go to their boss's office and say, you're, you're killing my creativity. Um, especially if he's that type of boss. And I'm using the word he there quite deliberately because 90% of the time it is. But, but if you're playing the game and you've just got a virtual card game going and you're saying, well, let's, put, let's vote anonymously on what we think are the top killers or the top suspects, it becomes a really interesting snapshot of the company culture. And if everyone's feeling that fear is the biggest killer, then we have to address the issue of fear within, within the company before we can expect them to go on and be creative. Yeah, I find that quite intriguing as to how it sort of plays out. And I imagine every office environment would be different. Um, everyone's personal. Absolutely. Uh, so no, never been doing different. it for 20 years. Never yeah. never had anything even close to identical. <laughs> yeah. you know, so with fear, yeah. would well, another lens look at that be potentially confidence in someone? someone? Yeah, well, it could be. As I said, it might not just be fear from the office. It might be fear yeah. from their upbringing. Um, a, a parent that has always told them they don't fail or or you know the kids that have been told they have to succeed in school and therefore they can't you can't take risks i'll give an example when you work for a startup in silicon valley you're proud to go home and tell your parents you've got a job in a startup you find one singapore one singaporean millennial that is proud to tell their parents that they're excited about joining a startup in Singapore because the culture of Singapore is all about, it's changing, but the culture has been in Singapore very much all about get it right, do it perfectly, ace your maths and science. Um, that's, what, that's what's been really important in Singapore. So kids that are asked to go to startups, it's too risky. The parents don't like it. They want you to join the government or become a lawyer or, or one or of the big bank consulting bank. firms. So, so that must hang over kids if all of a sudden they find themselves in a startup or in a creative environment. They're asked to be creative, but their whole school life um, has been about ach- achieving grades because you see school in the high school years, it does not reward creativity. In terms of um, digging in, getting awareness around who killed creativity, what does that do in, in the mindset of the, the people in the business, um, just in the in the person themselves? How does that help? Well, look, it depends uh, whether you're very proactive and, and want to, you know, it's like some of us love to go to a doctor and get fixed and others of us <laughs> won't go near it, even if our tooth is completely decayed or a dentist. Fair point. Uh, I think, I think yeah. you'd say the same thing. There are some people that are too afraid because, you know, when we played this game with their own team, I came up as the control freak. Uh, you know, that's, that's not a, which I already knew, but that's not a, yes. a pleasant thing to know, but it was kind of fun to do it. So, you know, a very proactive leader will say, look, I really want to know about my team. I want to do the diagnostic. I I I mean, you've got to have a burning recognition that creative thinking is absolutely critical for your industry. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to be prepared to take the medicine um, to say, we really need to do this diagnostic. Now, as I said, we've done it as a TED talk, keynote talks, um, online workshops, but we've now got a self-designed game that you can do online with a team of six people it's eight people you can buy it online we don't even we, without us and it just walks you through the instructions so a proactive boss can buy that who kill creativity game um, and just run it in totally internally without the, with their team without a facilitator if they don't feel they can afford to pay for one um, and that's okay if they're proactive and they want to do something about it they go online buy the game and and, and run it through and it, it's not a game in terms of a competitive game it's just the opportunity to talk about these issues in what we call a fairly safe environment. Because as I said, no one's going to go and say, I've got too much fear, I've got too much pressure, um, I'm too apathetic. No one's going to do that. But if we get Mm. those cards on the table and get people to talk about them and almost play that Cluedo type game, who killed creativity with what weapon where, um, then it's sort of a fun, you know, you just move that card and you say, well, I think that card's, I think that, um, for example, um, negativity is in the finance department uh, with, a weapon of, with a weapon of, you know, strangling stress. And so what does that mean? Well, it means every time I've come up with these creative ideas, but every time I go to the finance guy, it just shuts me down. Mm. And look, we're not there to try and point fingers at people because it is the finance job to make sure the silly ideas don't get through. But it's just a, a diagnostic tool to allow people to actually talk about these issues and not think that creativity is just going to magically happen when the boss says, let's, let's have a beer and do some brainstorming. 
because there's too many things going on up here mm. <coughs> that's going to prevent that creativity happening. Or let's watch a TED talk or let's go and do a design thinking course. That's what everyone's doing now. They go and do their course and they come away with these great seven steps on how to solve difficult problems. But no one's got the right mindset. There's no culture. There's no tolerance of failure. There's no understanding of what the process is. And as I said before, if we've grown up with a life of fear of failure through our school or university, we're not going to put out ideas because we don't want to have that pain of being shut down again. It's a... It's an interesting one. There's a lot of psychology behind this, clearly, um, that drives the way people think. And you have those people that are very creative and will just uh, throw ideas at anything. And you have the people in the corner that will be afraid to add value. And I find that mm. even within our business, you have some quiet guys that won't add too much to a creative conversation. or And it, it, you'd like to draw some things out of them because you know that they have um, an ability to add value. And you're just, you're just in that sort of workshopping environment, they get a little bit stuck. So then you, then you have people yeah. like me dominate it too much. Dominate, yeah, and I think you need to, and it's just about awareness, right? And if you're dominating the conversation, sometimes you have to take a step back. So mm. um, there's plenty in that to learn, and I think awareness can be a big thing. So if you're finding that you know business finance departments pretty much blocking everything, um, that is probably um, what do you do then? I think that's awareness is one thing. So how do we bring about change within the creative mindset, really? Well, we have to start yeah. with, first of all, a burning desire to see why this yeah. topic is so important. As, mm -hmm. And as AI, artificial intelligence, you know, slowly creeps into everything, you've got to ask yourself, what skills will I be able to contribute mm -hmm. to the workplace? And I hate to say it, but most of the skills that we currently contribute will be automated by AI. Uh, perhaps the only skill that uh, AI won't be able to automate will be creative thinking because it won't be able to take two totally unrelated ideas. It's very good at looking at patterns and, and, and predicting patterns, but creative thinking is about taking two things that would never be possibly on anyone's radar. Um, so we first of all have to, have, I think, have a burning desire to realise that this is absolutely critical. It's not an option. You know, 20 years ago when we used to do conferences, people would, I'd say to the, the boss, why are you doing creative thinking? He said, oh, we did presentation skills last year and we did sales this <laughs> year before and negotiation the year before. Maybe we should do creative thinking. Well, mm. I, you know, great. So I'm the fifth option because they've run out of ideas. <laughs> Um, you know, yeah. that's not going to cut it. So we've really got to have the, the managers, the bosses coming and saying, boy, we the only way we're going to get ahead of our competition, the only way we're going to not be disrupted by innovation is to actually start with the creative thinking process. And so first of all, it's got to start with a burning desire that this is should be number one on people's radar. Then after that, it's about using this diagnostic tool that we've created to get people to feel comfortable sharing and talking and, and, and even laughing a little bit about it and understanding, well, if we live in a culture of fear, which I talked about before, it's not going to happen. If we live in a culture of pressure where we're constantly checking our emails every minute um, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, we know that the brain takes about 20, about 30 minutes to get into a creative state of flow. So if we're thinking that we can um, be interrupted regularly and then think we can be creative after we, our whole day is chopped up into regulated uh, interruptions, it's not going to happen. And so, therefore, once we've recognised that these are the things that are out the biggest killers or the biggest blockers to creativity, we then need to start putting some action plans. So I've even you know, done this with corporate lawyers that you know, live in six-minute billings, which is fine. That's their life. I'm not going to ask them to all throw out that and become creative. But they did agree that if they're going to do creative, they need to go off-site. They need mm -hmm. to get away from their phones, uh, maybe somewhere that's out of, out of the office. And then we'll do some creative thinking where they're not getting distractions because in their office, it's impossible. You just so said 30 once minutes. Once we know there. what those skills are, then we can start looking at the strategies to actually rescue them. You just said 30 minutes to get into a creative frame or flow. Um, and I think a lot of us are pulled and prod. I think, yeah, going into... Um, the working home environment, being online with what's happened with COVID, we're still working from home. I find that um, there's a lot more disruptions when you work from home. It's, mm. I find that pretty ironic. Sitting in an office with people around, you can get a bit of quiet time sometimes. <laughs> but when you've got um, chat, things going on, there's things popping up, there's alerts and messages. What does it actually do to the creative mindset? So you're saying that if you're not sitting there uninterrupted for 30 minutes, there's 
really no ability to get into a creative frame of mind. Yeah, well, Mikhail yeah. Chikmihal, I can never pronounce his name, who wrote the psychology book called Flow, said that it, mm. it typically takes, I'm not going to say exactly 30 minutes, yeah. but it typically takes 30 minutes to for your brain to start really focusing and getting into that state of creative flow mm. where, where ideas come and we, we're not being distracted. And so... You know, again, I'm not telling people to tell their boss, don't disturb me for the next three hours or for the next three years. It doesn't go down too well. But again, <laughs> if we're going to ask to be creative, we need to set the right environment to do it. We can't just wake up and say we're going to do it. So if you want to be creative, um, you need to remove those distractions. So it might mean um, doing a lot of technical checking emails and everything in the morning and then after lunch saying, that's it, I'm, I'm going to lock myself away for a few hours. It really depends on what you want to achieve for the day. But what we find is that most people subconsciously just, uh, they just respond to everything. You know, social media drives us. The media that we use drives us. We don't drive it. So when a ding happens, um, we stop and, and we pick it up and we're interrupted. Now, why not? There's a whole floor of Facebook lawyers and, and, and the smartest people in the world that are doing nothing but trying to fiddle with our behavior so we we open their app and they're competing against the google nerds and the and the apple people that are all trying to you know compete for our attention we we don't have a hope of single individuals uh to be <laughs> we, we are totally being controlled uh on how, on how we respond to our digital age by outside experts and so it's, it's really about taking control of that and saying look i'm i'm happy to check my whatever whenever but i'm going to do it under my conditions and if i need to be creative today um, that phone's going off or I'm not going to have interruptions. Why do we have most creative ideas when we're away on holidays or in the shower or, or driving? It's because we're in that uninterrupted time. Mm. And one you should be walking to the bathroom in the office. Exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 Every time and, I and come that, back from the office, I get something at Andrew. accessing different parts of our brain. So our, if you put our brains under MRI scanners or all the different scanners that you can go under, you'll see different parts of the brain lighting up under different environment. And the creative brain lights up under certain conditions. And if those conditions are not there, the creative brain won't happen. And that brings us to why children are so creative, because they don't really have many of these killers hovering around their life. And I use the word killers as in fictional killers. I, so I don't want you pointing fingers at your boss after listening to this session. Um, but children don't seem to have the same level of killers that, um, that adults have. And so therefore we have to be more aware of it. And that, that's why it's always interesting to ask people who thinks they're more creative when they were kids and about 90 odd percent of people put their hands up who thinks they're more creative now. I'm lucky to get two or three out of an audience. That's no surprise really, I think. Um as kids, just to, I've got a, a two-year-old and a, and a four-year-old, five-year-old, they will just come up with, find something on the floor, a piece of Play-Doh, and this is a ship, or this is a, whatever right. it might be, and it's just that their imagination runs wild, and so I don't, when we get older, we just pick it up, and it's a piece of Play-Doh, or it's a toy, the toy is what it is, and they just imagine something else, so it's... Yeah. It's a very different world being a kid. What What is the difference then? So they have, don't have the blockers? Is that what it is? Or just um, well, bringing right. in all I mean, the I mean, this information? Experience. Yeah, exploring. We, we, made a great, yeah. we made a great video. It's, it's, it's yeah. a little bit old these days yeah. in terms of it's, it's, it's showing mm. its age. Mm. Uh, but, it, but it's still magical in the sense that we went into my kids' school, international school in Asia, uh -huh. and started in kindergarten and asked them, how many of you think you're creative? And then went through each class and just yeah. asked them to put their hands up. There's a, the video is called Hands Up. Um, and it's, it, it, it follows the research that, you know, every single kid in kindergarten was just busting to put their hand up. Me, 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 me. And by the time we got to year 12, they all sat there like this. Yeah, now, I had a good relationship with the teachers, so I went to the teachers and said, guys, what's happening? And that's where I got that quote from my son's maths teacher that said that, unfortunately, particularly high school, it rewards correct answers, not creative answers. Um, and yet the math teacher said, well, we need creativity to survive. So you'll see that um, I think whether it's our school, whether it's just part of our getting um, assimilated into society, but most of our society rewards correctness. Uh, it takes courage to be creative because you will probably be ridiculed or failed because, as I said, for the, every one idea you get, you're going to have to go through ten hundreds of crappy ones. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a path to heroism or patting on the back. We only, unfortunately, because of survivorship bias, read about the, the heroes. We don't read about the ones that didn't come up with the creative ideas. They just sort of disappear. So I think as kids <clears throat> get older, they lose that ability to be creative. They, they lose that ability to make connections because it's almost educated out of them. And so right when we need it, we don't have it. Mm. Uh, and yet kids don't have the critical thinking. So that's why they're not CEOs of companies. They have the, you know, they can turn Play-Doh into a sailing boat, 
but they don't have the technical engineering skills to actually do it. Um, so that's why we need the creative and critical thinking. So those quiet people in the room, back to Anthony, your point, they're really valuable. We're not asking them to all of a sudden become extroverts for a day. We're asking them to be quiet and reflective. But again, if you go through the right process of design thinking, professionally facilitated, there will come a time where I'll be saying, Anthony, it's time you zip up. We've heard enough from you. Now, yeah, John, you've been sitting in the corner really quietly over there. How are you feeling? And John will be going, mm, I don't think that's going to work. And okay, John, why? Because now we're moving into the critical thinking phase, and that is the actual making of it work. So you can't allow the creative people to run the company because it'll be very expensive and too many failures. But we must get that team to work together. Or we, we say, for this part of the workshop, we're going to do creative thinking. And now for this part of the workshop, we're now going to apply it and see if it'll actually work. Yeah, that balance has to be struck. In terms of um, an individual, um, if they're looking to be more creative or encourage creative thinking within themselves, what are some of the processes they might encourage? Like if clearly put the phone away, put the uh, the uh, email away, do something like that. What I, I was watching a Netflix documentary on um, the creative brain and I found that quite intriguing as to um, opening yourself up to different experiences can mm. um, allow your brain to draw dots and start bringing things together. And that's generally what we do to create. It's bringing one thing from one world and bringing it into another and colliding and you create something new or a new experience. So what would you, how would you encourage people to, to be a bit more creative? That are not well, why don't we sort of slowly moving around the killers? We've done yeah. control, fear yeah. and pressure. Well, now yeah. we'll move into yeah. narrow mindedness and, okay. um, and groupthink. Um, and, and I think the, the, the danger that we have as adults is we really get into our bubbles mm. um, and we're seeing that more and more now with what's happening in social media where we're all surrounded by groupthink mm -hmm. and people like us um, and so we'll read the same paper they read, we'll listen to the same music or podcasts and we don't get exposure. I mean, there's been some great research on the Republican and Democrats um, over in, in, in America and just how polarising they're becoming. Um, and so what's happening is we, we're turning ourselves into little group think groups of, of yes people mm -hmm. and we're not getting that extended exposure. So my, my answer there would be to get out and, get, and, and expose yourself to something different. Go and try a different food. Um, they've got done research that people that speak two languages are more creative because they can think in different languages. Um, kids that have grown up like my kids in a, in a third, cult, third culture kids, kids that have grown up in another culture mm -hmm. or been exposed to multiculturalism. Look, this is the funny thing about all the tech companies that got busted with diversity um, and continually to get busted with diversity. Um, they, they get busted and then they do this big PR campaign that diversity is important for us and we value diversity because it's morally correct, but they don't because they only did it because they got busted. Um, you know, a Google went through this uh, a few years ago when they talked about the Google bus. If there were 10 people on the Google bus, nine and a half of them would be white males in their 30s. Mm. Um, and so none of them will really understand what it must be like to be my age and not to be able to read the tiny font or to be a single mother um, or, or live in a poor suburb. And so they're not getting that exposure. And the problem is, even though Google's the most creative company in the world, you can go to Google and live in the Google canteen and eat at the go uh, launder your clothes in the Google laundry and go to the Google gym. And guess who you're meeting at the Google gym? You're meeting other Google people. So you're not getting that cross exposure. And therefore, when you're designing something, you're not able to, you know, the first step of design thinking is empathy mapping and persona techniques and putting your uh, putting yourself in the shoes of the end user. Well, if all end users are white 30 year old males, it's going to be very hard to work out what it must be like to be someone else. So even Google, which is considered the most innovative company in the world, is in danger of this of this killer called narrow mindedness. And that is um, not exposing yourself to, to things way outside your comfort zone. Um, Emirates had a great aeroplane advertisement many years ago that said, when was the last time you did something for the first time? <laughs> now, yes. I love lots of sports and I've been doing a lot of extreme sports for many years. Mm. But it was only recently I took up a couple of new sports. And at my age, it's, 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 it's freaky to, to fall off something and not think you can do it when everyone else can do it. And you almost want to give up because most of us did all that when we were children. And then we just got better and better at it. And to try something new at, as an adult, is it, it's humiliating. 
uh, you think you'll never get it, mm -hmm. and yet you see everyone else doing it. So my answer to that is let's get rid of that narrow-mindedness. Let's cross-expose ourselves to different cultures, to different ways of thinking. Um, Margaret Hefferman wrote a book on, called Will, Willful Blindness, and she talked about the fact that the CEO that goes to work today in his, in his limousine bubble every day um, and steps out of his house or steps into his office and bypasses everything that's going on in the community will never really get an understanding of what's going on out there in the community. And as I said, the first stage of design thinking is to put yourself in the position of the user. So we've, we, you know, as I said, take the bus, mm. take the train, sit somewhere different, go and eat outside of your suburb, uh, you know, have a look around, travel when you're, if you can. Um, read something different. I mean, I often get stuck in hotels and, I'm, and I, I, I don't get CNN. I get stuck with Fox TV, Fox News. Well, I can tell you, Fox News is a little bit different to CNN. And I'm sort of kind of curious as I travel between, used to travel between hotels and one hotel was CNN and the other one was Fox. Uh, that was kind of interesting to, to do it. If, if, if something happened, uh, with, you know, with all the politics that's going on in America and you're just getting fed one stream, Go and have a look at what the other people are saying and, and see, not, not to disagree with them, but to try and understand why they're saying that. And that will expose you to become more uh, cross-thinking and that will allow you to become more creative because you'll see a much bigger picture of things. I find it... And that's the problem, sorry, it was the same with like social media, Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram, those sort of things, where you're giving signals for the things you like and then they're going to feed you more information about what will gain your attention, which are the things you like. So you never see the other side. That's, what I'm That's saying. why, like we, you said, the left and right. against the smartest. It's, it's you and me yeah, as individuals versus the impossible. smartest floor of every building in Silicon Valley that are that have got one goal in mind, and that is not to better us as people. Yeah. Um, even your attention. The phrase was don't be evil. Um, you know, they, they, they need to make money for their stakeholders. They need our attention. It's, it's a war of attention. And if they want to feed us something just a little bit more radical than the last article we read because it'll it's clickbait and we'll want to read on it. Yeah. Um, there's no ethics in that. Uh, Tristan, what, the guy that's come out and did the Netflix special on the social... Um, yeah, social dilemma. It's called social. Yes, you social know, he dilemma. talked about the fact that there's, there's the, 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 the problem is there's the, he was the one ethicist in his company that was there to try and say, well, what's going on? No lawyer gets consulted. No child educational specialist gets consulted when there's a competition for apps. So it really is me versus, versus a very large company. And, and unfortunately, the large company's got the expertise. So it really is our job to, to look, still use it. I'm not, I'm not a luddy by any means. I love my, my digital. But, but it's time we took control over it and we decided when we were going to use it, bearing in mind that there's a whole floor of people right now trying to do the opposite. Yeah, their aim is to keep your attention yeah. on there and get that dollars Unfortunately, by spent. doing that, their aim is to block out. I mean, I'm not saying they're deliberately trying to block our creativity, um, but, but, in, in, but in their aim to keep our attention impact. and feeding us things we already want to know. And the algorithms are set up to say, well, if you like this one, you'll like this one. And before you know it, you, you're down a rabbit hole. Um, that's great. That's their job. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be their job, but... but we just need to be aware of it. I'm not, they're not going to change. They can't. They're, they're, owned, by, yeah. they're owned by shareholders. We just need to be aware of that and make sure that we are understanding how to use tech sensibly. Um, and hopefully the next generation, it won't be as big an issue. We'll, we'll be a little bit more educated. But look, I'm here to talk about creativity. I'm not here to bash the tech, I'm, but I'm here to say, if we, to answer your question, if we want to understand how to be creative, we need to be less narrow-minded. Mm. And if we want to be less narrow-minded, we need to be careful about what we digest. How about we summarise? Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot yeah, of and sense. And diversify and look at all point of view. In terms of that, that narrow-mindedness, what have you found? So obviously, you work with a lot of um, corporates that are, have had their employees working from home, stuck in a bubble, what impact has that had? I've heard the impact of productivity going up, but I imagine that creativity might be dwindling because of the... the no, creativity is going down yeah. because we, we know that the best creative ideas happen from bumping into each other. Mm. And I'll go back and use Google as a good example yeah. now because I don't want to bag mm -hmm. the most innovative company in the world because they're very good at what they do. But their canteen is, is um, you know, it's, it's designed to have people bump into each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, it's not just money to spend because they're being altruistic. They've built a beautiful canteen because they know that's the place where the engineer and the salesperson. So on, on the plus side, whether it's the canteen or the squash courts or the gym, they know that these 
uh, what we call water cooler interactions of social people banging into each other and just just having a chat and, and on the back of a nap and listening to that mm. again, listening to that other idea from another department mm. and you're from this department and going, oh, wow, I can put these together. So these big companies have been very, very clever at saying, well, why don't we create these beautiful environments where people want to be together and enjoy each other's company rather than shoving them off into their departments and never having them cross each other? Mm. Um, so I worked with a four-star Hong Kong company that were out in new territories. Their office was nothing like Google. And I told them that, and they said, well, you know, look at our office. We, we can barely even walk in the hallways. Uh, how are we going to get people banging into each other? And I said, well, what does everyone do for coffee? And they said, well, they all go out and buy $1 coffee down at 7-Eleven. I said, well, can you spend $300 and put an espresso machine mm. in the hallway? And they did, and all of a sudden the hallways got really full. You know, people love to save a dollar. Mm -hmm. um, but, but now the buzz was around the coffee machine, and it was all squashed into this hallway, which kind of made it quite cute. But now we're banging into each other. Um, now, to get back to what's happening with all of us working from home, it's not happening. Mm. And, and there's research, I can't remember whether, whether it was Salesforce I read, but yep. one of the companies has done research on this, that we're not having that social interaction that we were having every day in the good offices mm -hmm. um, where we can bang into each other and share ideas and bump into things. This is why Europe um, became so creative in the Renaissance compared to some of the other countries globally because it, it, it let its borders down and people were able to cross between things and share ideas and uh, people were coming into villages and this is where Europe really got its head start if we want to look at it on a country countryside of things. It, it allowed the freedom for people to cross and bang into each other. Um, the Australian Aboriginal people uh, didn't have that. Jared Diamond talks about this a lot, that they were so far away from each other because Australia is such a big, a big country. Place, yes. The Aboriginal groups did not get, the, our native people didn't get a chance to, Indigenous people didn't get a chance to constantly be banging into each other and, and sharing ideas. So that's why cities are so much more creative than rural, and rural is so much more creative than, the, than a more uh, indigenous population that live far and far away from each other. And then Jared Diamond goes on to talk about the Tasmania, which is obviously extremely isolated, was thousands of years behind in terms of technology from the indigenous people. And that's nothing to do with them, it's to do with the isolation factor. Um, and so on the plus side, it's the cities that allow the creative ideas to get together. There's some research, I can't remember the exact number, but the bigger the city, it's exponentially more creative. And the smaller the city, it's exponentially less creative. And this is all about the collision of ideas of people banging into each other and seeing these ideas. So as we live in isolation, whether you're a, a, a group of people out in, out, in the, uh, out in the desert of Australia. Thanks for joining us, Andrew, on uh, the Dev Ready Podcasts. We're gonna end uh, this episode here uh, on who killed creativity. And we're gonna be uh, joined by Andrew again on part two, talking about some of the tools that you can actually uh, bring into um, yourself, your workplace to help uh, foster creativity. Andrew, thanks for joining us.